Welcome to Choice Classic Radio. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and help keep this show alive by donating at choiceclassicradio.com. For more of your favorite old-time radio shows, join us on our companion podcast, Choice Classic Radio, Mystery, Suspense, Dramas, and Horrors, where we bring to you the most mysterious tales that the golden age of radio had to offer. And now, with 728 episodes made, broadcasting on CBS Radio Network from 1949 to 1962, we bring to you, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Al Harper at Corinthian, Johnny. I got a case here you won't like, but the commission will be good if we beat it. How big is the policy? $250,000. But you'll have to fly to Hong Kong. Well, you still haven't scared me, Al. Is there something you're leaving out? Yeah, the policyholder. Trans-Pacific Import-Export Company. We've had trouble with them before, remember? Yeah. I sent flowers to the widow. You want to take a crack at it? No. But I will. Edmund O'Brien in another transcribed adventure, The Man with the Action-Packed Expense Account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense Account. Submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Corinthian Liability and Risk, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of the Trans-Pacific Import-Export Company, South China Branch. Expense Account Item 1, $1,200, fare and incidental expenses between Hartford and Hong Kong. I realized three minutes after I got off the plane that there is no longer any simplicity in Hong Kong. To fill the smallest want is a complicated problem. There is a shortage of transportation, food, water, and space. Both the island and the city of Kowloon on the mainland have been swamped by the flood of millions of refugees moving out of the interior. I fought my way through the jammed streets and to the offices of the American consul. Oh, yes, it's true. Life is very difficult here. Where are they all going? Many of them don't know. Where is it for them to go? Well, what do they do? How do they stay alive? Many of them don't. Yes, sir? Uh, The gentleman from the States. Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Would you send him in, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Grover is ready to speak with you. Thank you. Hartford, Connecticut, eh? (laughs) Sounds foreign. Uh I suppose it would. It's a pleasure, Mr. Dollar. Grover. Insurance investigation, eh? Yes, sit down. Hmm. Well, I don't suppose my problem will seem very important out here. Yeah, I, I was thinking the very same thing. It's it's always the case. On the fringe of war, very few individual problems are important. Nor are the individuals themselves. I trust you will keep that in mind while you are here. Hey, now, then, uh, what is your errand? The Trans-Pacific Import-Export Company. Oh, yes, yes. Will Meadows' firm on the mainland destroyed by fire last month. One hundred percent, according to the claim he sent the company that hired me. Two hundred thousand dollars. Do you know this, William Meadows? Uh, I've met him at the American Club now and again. The company isn't satisfied with the report on the cause of that fire. It was blamed on vandalism. The vandalism has become quite a popular pastime across in Kowloon, especially... I take it you suspect fraud. Trans-Pacific had a branch in Shanghai. When the war closed in on them up there, the same thing happened. They came out far better by collecting on the insurance than they would have by standing the expense of liquidating. Uh, I suppose coincidence won't quite do, will it? Uh, What do you want from this office, Dollar? I'd appreciate some phone calls or letters that would get me some support from the fire brigade and the police. So we're back to the individual problem. Yeah, but I'll do the best I can. Thank you, Mr. Grover. I won't take up any more of your time. Uh, Let me know how you make out. Uh, Oh, uh, have you found a place to stay? No, not yet. Well, don't bother with the occidental places. They're jammed. Uh, But speak with my receptionist, Mr. Vedras. Yeah, I saw on the way in. Uh, Vedras? I thought she was Chinese. Half. Her father is Portuguese. 
Here's accommodations about uh, halfway up the peak on Sing Wong. Charming girl, nice people. Oh, good. I'll ask her. And thanks again. Oh, Dollar, uh, just a matter of interest. Uh, the case in Shanghai. Uh, you say the insurance company was forced to meet the claim there? That's right. The investigator they sent over was killed before he could build a case. Oh? They blamed his death on war conditions, too. Said he was robbed and knifed by starving refugees. Nobody had time to dig up the truth. Sing Wong is a street of steps that climb from the waterfront to the plush European residences on top of Victoria Peak. My accommodations were a room that looked out on an alley, an iron bed, a chair, and a pitcher of water on a bamboo table. There were no other non-Orientals in the building, but I seemed to be the only one that noticed it. I was suffering from a sort of claustrophobia and loneliness that night. And at first, I was glad to learn it was she who knocked at my door. Oh, see if you are comfortable. Oh, thank you. I am. Oh, this is fine. Oh, I, I don't have much to offer you. A cigarette? Scotch? Uh, no, thank you. I came because I am curious. I'm in Hong Kong on business, if that's what you mean. It's better kept confidential right now. Is it? Danger in this business? Why do you ask that? Because you are followed here. You are being watched. How do you know? Oh, I know this street. I've seen this man. He has not been here before. Where is he? Maybe you can see him from the window. Wait a minute. You tell me where he is. I'll look. Shop on the other side. There are boxes piled near the door. Yeah. Well... Thanks for telling me about him. Do you know who he is? No. I didn't think anybody knew I was in town. Let's talk about something else. What is that music? Oh, it is a love song. There's about two lonely people who meet near a river. Oh? In America, they're different. Yes, I know. I like them. You know many Americans? Yes, I... I want to marry one. <laughs> He's a lucky American. Oh, no. I, I don't mean there's only one. I want to marry an American who will take me from China. There's no other way. You hate it that much? There's nothing else to do but hate it. There's no good here. Always trouble. Chinese are very patient people. But I am not all Chinese. I can't make myself be patient any longer. I want to go. What about your Portuguese people? They are gone. You think I am bad to be this way? Honestly, I... I didn't say that. I am not bad. I hope you find your American, Miss Vedras. You want me to go now? I think you'd better. I'll see you tomorrow. Yes. Good night. Three things interfered with sleep that night. The watcher who was still at a station across the street when I turned out my light, the pleading in the eyes of the girl, and the smells and sounds that drifted into me from the restless, crowded city. It was 4 a.m. before I dropped off, and at 10, I was walking up the gravel drive that led to the residence of Mr. William Meadow. The watcher had changed, but I was still being followed. Is Mr. Meadow at home? Oh, yes, sir. You give them. Who is it, Lamb? My name is Dollar, Mr. Meadow. I'm from Corinthian Liability, Hartford office. Well, so they sent another snoop. Let him in, Lamb. You come in. What did you say your name was? Dollar. What's the matter with that company, anyway? This doesn't have to be unpleasant, Mr. Meadow. They sit back there in Hartford with nothing to worry about but Sunday's golf game. They don't know anything about the conditions we're working under. They do know that your fire here pretty much follows the pattern of the one in Shanghai. Of course it does. The conditions are the same. Including the starving refugees who killed and robbed the investigator? Careless people are dying here every day. Now say what you have to say to me and get out of here. Well, it's very little. 
I came here to get my reaction to you. I have. You jumped to the conclusion you were under suspicion before I got through the door. You're on the defensive, so you must have a reason to be. And more important, you're having me followed, so you must be afraid of me. Have your dreams, Dollar. But have them someplace else. Now get out of here. Go snoop through the ashes. They're cold. Expense account item two, approximately $4 American taxi and rickshaw fares. Leg work is strenuous enough in a familiar city. In Hong Kong, it took me the whole afternoon to locate three people who had worked in the office of the Trans-Pacific Company. The first was Franklin Abbott, accountant. Please find enclosed transcript of his statement signed before witnesses. Well, I didn't give a thought to how it started, to tell you the truth. I just went to work one morning, and there it was, ashes. Well, had they made any preparations for going out of business? No. How about the rest of the firms in that section? There was all closing. We might just as well have. There wasn't no trade. Well, still, they hadn't moved any of their merchandise out. That's right. The storehouse was full. I suppose your books were destroyed, too? Oh, yes, sir. Everything went. It must have been a vicious blaze. Well, how about the other companies? Any of them burned out? No. Huh. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah? The other storehouses over there, the empty ones. There wasn't no vandals burning them. The people broke in and lived in them. Separately, the other enclosed statements aren't very strong evidence either. The night watchman who was discharged just before the night of the fire and the clerk who had seen William Meadow burning a confidential memo from Trans-Pacific's head office in San Francisco. But with the three together in my hand, I could begin to see a case building against them. I was dog-tired that night when I climbed the steps of my Sing Wong Street to my hotel. What are you doing in here? Oh, it's nothing wrong. I came to wait for you. Why? Because I am curious. Because I thought of you today. I wondered where you were and what you thought because I was so bold last night. I've been busy. You didn't think? Yes, I thought. Still watching? A different one. But still watching. Are you frightened? I don't know. It's nerve wracking. I've been followed all day. Are you a criminal? <laughs> no. But you're right, I'm acting like one. Because I feel uneasy in your city. And I'm trying to do a job another man tried to do in Shanghai and got himself killed. I will not ask any more. If that hadn't happened, I could take you someplace tonight, be with people. But I can't take a chance. I have to stay here in my room and hide. Oh, I don't want to go anywhere. Because if I can keep myself alive, I might be able to save $250,000 for a company with $50 million in declared assets. Now let's talk about you. I'm glad you waited for me. I think the toughest part of the case was the memory of the murder of that other insurance investigator in Shanghai. It made every group of Hong Kong Chinese potential assassins and every doorway a potential ambush. Gathering the actual evidence was almost easy. The next afternoon, with a supervisor from one of the fire brigades, I went to the scene of the fire on the outskirts of Kowloon. Actually, Mr. Dollar, under the present circumstances here in China, arson can hardly be classed as crime. In the face of war, destruction of material is a common defensive maneuver. Ah, I see what you mean. Unless, of course, criminal intent can be proved. And even then, with an American firm, it's rather awkward. The prosecution will be up to you people. What I want is evidence that will stand up in court against their claim in the company. How do you think the fire started? Well, inside the structure, without a doubt. And by means of apparatus, one would hardly find in the possession of common bandits. What? Uh, timing devices. You have proof of this? We recovered fragments, yes. Well, could I get photographs of these things and sworn statements from you? Yes, certainly. It's a pleasure to be of service to you. Expense 
expense account item three, approximately $45 American, a case of scotch in lieu of payment for the photo lab and clerical work the supervisor and his men did for me. By the time we were through, the company, at least, was protected. Pictures and photostats of all the statements had been posted to the Hartford office. It was well after nine that night when I started to climb toward the hotel, and I noticed that for the first time since I checked in, I wasn't being followed. I took it for a good omen until I got there and saw the man who should have been following me standing inside the door. I can't help stay away from American men. I know good for her, but she don't listen. She goes to him last night. She waits for him. Now, now, quiet, Dan. Quiet, Dan. There he is. Stay there. Quiet, Dan, I say. What's this? What are you doing out in the open? Did you lose me? Constable Tryon, Hong Kong police. There's been trouble here, Mr. Dollar. Police? What happened? His daughter's been killed. Shot. She's in your room. One of your longtime mystery favorites, Philip Marlowe, is now heard on CBS on Friday nights. Philip Marlowe, Up for Parole, and Songs for Sale. That's the lineup of fine shows for Friday now on most of these same CBS stations. Hear them this Friday, hear them every Friday on CBS. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, Up for Parole, and Songs for Sale. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. were fired through the window. Shade was drawn. She must have been right in front of it. Light behind her. How well did you know her? Just for a couple of days. A jealous suitor, perhaps. She was beautiful. How come you were following me, Constable? Orders direct from the Inspector General. Request came from a Mr. Grover at the American Consulate. Said you needed protection. Well, then you know better than to mention a jealous suitor. She was killed because with only a shadow behind that shade, they thought it was me. Where were you when it happened? I was waiting for you outside Brigade Headquarters when I heard about it. When did it happen? No more than 15 minutes ago. 15 minutes? Why couldn't we have been here? Just 15 minutes. It's too late to bother yourself with what might have happened. Besides, it's not the same as as it would have been if she was a British national. Oh, shut up. I beg your pardon. Take me down to your lieutenant or superintendent or whoever he is. I'll, I'll make my statement of him. Good evening, sir. This is the American chap, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes, yes. Superintendent Clyde. Pleasure to meet you, sir. Thank you. I want to make a statement on the Vedras shooting. Vedras? I don't think it's got to you yet, sir. What with all of them these days? A Chinese girl. Fathers are Portuguese. I see. Hmm. You're in possession of information pertaining to this case, Mr. Dollar? Information? I know who's guilty. I'm not sure who fired the gun, but an American national named William Meadow is guilty. My now, don't gift- stop me. She was killed in my room. She was killed because she was mistaken for me. I've been here three days collecting evidence of attempted insurance fraud against Meadow. And that's why she was killed, because they mistook her for me. He's got to be arrested tonight. Good Lord, sir. I, I can't place a man under arrest on the basis of a statement like that. Certainly not an American. I have proof of a motive. Here. The evidence of fraud is right there. Photographs, statements. Look at them. Beg your pardon, sir. It was a Chinese girl who was killed. By mistake. Rather difficult to prove, I'm afraid. She was in my room. My dear chap, do you have proof that this uh, this meadow fellow knew where you lived, which room was yours? Oh, how do you prove things like that? Unfortunately, there are certain niceties of jurisprudence which we must respect. Right or wrong, sir, I'm convinced of your sincerity, and I appreciate it. That's good. Could you help me look up the phone number of Mr. Grover's home? I have to see him. Yes, Constable Crane will help you and see you safely there. This way, sir. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Dollar, your evidence. You've forgotten it. Well, if it's too weak to make you believe me, I don't need it anymore. <laughs> Here we are, sir. 
Will he be with Mr. Grove along? I don't know. I'll wait in the car and get a breath of air. Beastly hot tonight. Oh, uh, come in. Come in. Dreadful news. You've heard then? Yes, yes. Terrible shock. Uh, come in here. I'll pour you a brandy. Did you hear about my part of it? No, no. Ju just, uh, just the bad tales. Her father was hysterical. Oh, I tell you, Mr. Grover, this thing is driving me crazy. It's my fault she's dead. Here you are, my boy. We got to know each other pretty well during those two days. I, I don't know quite how it happened. Uh, this has been a bad job for the nerves with my mind on what happened to the man in Shanghai. She was there. I got there yesterday after a bad day. I didn't know who was following me. I guess I needed somebody to be with, so she stayed for a while. Tonight, she was waiting for me in the room. That's why she was killed. They thought it was me. You're sure of this? I'm positive. As sure as if I'd had a camera on the whole thing, but I... I can't move the police. It, it's not enough. Well, did they have to be cautious? Look, something's got to be done. I, I can't have it left like this. I can't come into a life for two days and be responsible for a death and... and then see nothing done. Uh, I'm afraid it's too late to accomplish anything tonight. In the morning, when our thinking Look, is clear... Look, stop it. Stop it, will you? You're not going to tell me you... to go back to that room. <laughs> I'm sorry. You see, I at least am muddled. Of course, you can stay here. Oh, I, I didn't mean that. I, I'd rather try to think this thing out by myself. How can I get rid of that constable? I'm liable to kill him if I hear any more of his cheery words of sympathy. Where are you going? No place, just war. I'll let you out by the rear door. When you want to rest, please come back here. All right, I will. And please, be careful. It's not too wise to be on the streets at night anymore. It's a picture I'll never walk out of my mind. The girl who had wanted to leave China, lying with her head on one arm, as though she were asleep. I don't think I knew I would when I left Grover, but I did go back to the hotel and into the room. Her body was gone, but there were chalk marks on the floor where she'd lain. I transferred an automatic from my luggage to a coat pocket, and then I walked some more. Dollar, I was here yesterday. Let me in. You wait. Oh, uh, hello, uh, Mr. Metwell. He's he not here. Oh, oh, oh now please, you, you wait. Uh, He's not here. Close the door. Uh, Mr. Metal, he, he not uh, here. Metal! Uh, he not here. Uh, you come back. Where is he? Uh, he said he come back uh, two, three days. I got to find him. If you know where he is, tell me. Uh, no, uh, he come back. Listen, I don't want to hurt you. You understand? Oh, do not hurt. But I will hurt if I don't find out where he is. It's important. All right. He go Colon. And you go with me. If he's not there, then I hurt. Uh, uh, I've got to find him. Where is he? All right. I, I tell you. Repulse the bay. What? Repulse bay. Repulse bay. On the other side of the island. Where the big hotel is? Oh, yes. Uh, he's there. I can call there on the telephone? Oh, yes. Is he at the hotel? Oh, uh, no. Uh, he has a cottage. Uh, number seven. Uh, last one. Where's the telephone? Oh, oh, oh please. Uh, you not tell her you learn he's there. Oh, the telephone. Hong Kong police. I want to talk to the superintendent. Yes, sir. Clyde? Will you believe a confession from William Meadow? Eh, what? Who's this? Mr. Dollar? He's at Repulse Bay, Cottage 7. I'm going after him. If you want that confession, have some men there. Outside in an hour. And quiet until it's finished. Dollar! The 
taxi got me there in 40 minutes. I was a few yards in front of his cottage when the police car slid without lights and cut motor. Meadow? Meadow! Who is it? It's Dollar. Who the devil are you? Dollar. Is that hard to believe? That was somebody else in the hotel room. I want you to go back into town with me. Will you come out or shall I come in? I don't suppose it could be called hewing to the niceties of jurisprudence. Since Meadow was dead, he could neither speak nor write his confession. But there were two police car loads of expert witnesses who took the fact that he had opened fire as an acceptable admission of guilt. The same thing cleared me legally on the grounds of self-defense. I had hoped that it would help clear my mind, but it hasn't. Nothing good came out of the assignment except saving your company some money that it didn't know it had. Expense account item four, same as item one. Expense account total, $3,544. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd and David Ellis with music composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Edmund O'Brien may currently be seen starring in the Columbia Pictures production 711 Ocean Drive. Featured in tonight's cast were Tudor Owen, Lillian Bayef, High Everback, Robert Griffin, Hal March, and Dan O'Herlihy. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, Edmund O'Brien returns in another transcribed adventure of... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Every Thursday night, CBS brings you a top Hollywood star in a new radio play on the Hollywood Theater. Comedy and melodrama, fantasy and mystery. The dramatic fair on the Hollywood Theater is highly varied and always good entertainment. Stay tuned now for the Hollywood Theater, which follows over most of these same CBS stations. It's a concrete fact. The possible need for blood for our national forces is no longer a vague, shadowy possibility, says General George C. Marshall. The United States government has requested that the Red Cross again become the official agency for collecting blood for the armed forces, when and wherever needed. Dr. Eugene Atashek, medical director of the Los Angeles Regional Blood Service, voices the plea of the civilian doctor when he says, increasing quantities of blood must be made available for doctors to use in civilian practice. Red Cross can handle collection, processing, and distribution of blood. But you control the source. So call your Red Cross and make a date to give a pint of blood. Make a date to save a life.
This is CBS, where Philip Marlowe takes the case every Friday night. The Columbia Broadcasting System. That concludes today's episode. We'd like to thank you and remind you to donate at choiceclassicradio.com. Remember, your donations make episodes like this possible.